<laughs> Israel kills seven aid workers and leaders on three continents express outrage. A two-week Israeli operation leaves one of Gaza's main hospitals in ruins. Israel says it killed hundreds of Hamas fighters. Most of the buildings of the Al-Shifa medical complex were completely destroyed and burned. It is not possible to work an Al-Shifa medical complex like this again. And with 70% of schools in Gaza either damaged or destroyed, young Gazans struggle for education and normalcy. My dreams have been voided. My ambition has been broken. My dreams have been lost. They're nothing. Welcome to PBS News Weekly. I'm Nick Schifrin. There have been few incidents in six months of war in Gaza that created the level of outrage that followed Israel's strike this week on vehicles carrying members of the charity World Central Kitchen. Multiple airstrikes killed seven people, one Palestinian and six foreigners, including one dual American-Canadian. President Biden said he was, quote, outraged by the incident and spoke to the head of World Central Kitchen, Jose Andres. He also spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this week. And in that conversation, President Biden pushed for an immediate ceasefire and said U.S. policy would be determined by the U.S. assessment of Israel's investigation. In the words of the World Central Kitchen, this was a targeted attack a direct hit on the group's armored vehicle, incinerating everything and everyone inside. All that was left intact, a metal plate with the group's logo. They came here from all over the world to feed the hungry. They leave in the white body bags borne by this war's more than 30,000 victims. Among them, the group's Palestinian driver, Saif Abu Taha. This was all a mistake, said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Unfortunately, in the last day, there was a tragic incident of an unintended strike of our forces on innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in war. We are checking this thoroughly. We are in touch with the government, and we will do everything for this not to happen again. But World Central Kitchen says it coordinated with the Israeli military as a convoy left its warehouse in Deir el by the sea in central Gaza. The group says Israeli munitions hit an initial vehicle. Workers then moved to another vehicle that was struck, and then a third vehicle that was struck as they traveled on or next to the coastal road that Israel designates for humanitarian aid. We were targeted deliberately, nonstop, until everybody was dead in this convoy. Jose Andres is the founder of World Central Kitchen. He's a celebrity chef whose activism and charity has earned him deep respect among policymakers. The group also fed Israelis after Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack. He spoke to Reuters today. It looks like it's not a war against terrorism anymore. Seems this is a war against humanity itself. Hello everyone, Damian Chikin from Cairo. Damian Sobel from Poland recently showed a warehouse full of supplies to feed 20,000 Gazans. Hey, this is Zomi and Chef Olivier. We're at the Jirabalaki. While Zomi Frankcom was known by everyone as Zomi, she was Australian and in March showed off the World Central Kitchen's Gaza chef and the meals he prepared. Her friends said when others faced their darkest moments, she was a shining light of comfort. Last night, both their passports were covered in blood. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. And, uh, this is just uh, completely uh, unacceptable. Uh, Australia expects full accountability for the deaths of aid workers. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. We shouldn't have a situation where people who are simply trying to help their fellow human beings are themselves at grave risk. Multiple victims were British. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. We were asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. The war in Gaza has been the deadliest ever for humanitarian workers. The UN says at least 196 have been killed since Hamas's October 7 terrorist attacks. U.S. officials cite poor Israeli coordination and deconfliction. Today, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant promised to establish an independent investigation and brief NGOs on the findings, and to open a joint IDF international NGO situation room. On Friday, Israel opened more aid routes into Gaza on President Biden's urging. And the IDF dismissed two officers, reprimanded three more senior officers, and said the strike was, quote, due to a mistaken identification, errors in decision-making, and an attack contrary to the standard operating procedures. 
After the World Central Kitchen incident, aid organizations are suspending their Gaza operations as the UN warns that Gaza is on the brink of famine. The day after the attack, Amna Nawaz spoke with Sean Carroll, president and CEO of ANERA, a nonprofit that helps refugees in the Middle East and paused its operations in Gaza following the death of those World Central Kitchen workers. Sean, I just want to begin with your reaction to this news. What did you think when you heard about the killing of these World Central Kitchen aid workers? I thought, no, this this can't be. How can this be? They can't, this can't be. This, this can't be explained. It, it can't be. And then devastation. Um, World Central Kitchen are, is a partner. They're colleagues. They're friends. The people who were killed are people that our team in Gaza work with. So this was devastating, devastating news. And we should say to you and your team know this loss. Last month, you lost one of your team members, Musa Shawa, your logistics coordinator in Gaza, was killed in an Israeli airstrike after sheltering with his family in Deir al-Bala after he'd been out distributing aid. We are so sorry for your loss. But I have to ask, do you believe it's possible for aid workers to work safely in Gaza right now? Well, look, we've made a decision to pause our work and that's not a decision we came to lightly. Our Palestinian staff who, who live in the communities, who work in the communities they're, they're from and live in, they've never really had safety, but they kept going. And now this uh, level of, of depravity and inexplicable uh, killing, and I, I know there are questions and debates about whether it was intentional or unintentional. I think we need to ask ourselves, is, is one better than the other? If this was unintentional, how could this happen? This was a clearly marked humanitarian aid convoy of three cars with World Central Kitchen a logo uh, and lettering uh, clearly displayed. So how could it be an accident? And, and, and the, the evidence we've seen so far and what I've heard from our colleagues at World Central Kitchen suggested that it, that it wasn't an accident, it was intentional. Well, let me ask you about that, because Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has, in fact, said it was an unintentional strike, that it was what he called a tragic accident. I know you cited some of the evidence why you believe it wasn't, but why do you believe Israel would target humanitarian aid workers? I, you know, I, I don't know. And I think that's the question we all have to ask. And I think Israeli society and the Israeli government and the Israeli military need to ask themselves as well. Is this contributing to making Israel and Israelis safer? I, I, I don't see how it, it could be. So after the first reaction of shock and despair, the next reaction is, how could this be? It doesn't make any sense. I, I can't make any sense of it. How would this be serving any objectives that, that make sense for anybody, for any side of this of conflict? Netanyahu has also pledged a thorough investigation. U.S. officials have said today they hope it will be swift and that the findings will be made public. Do you have faith that the Israeli government can investigate its own forces in this case? When an investigation is, is needed, the, the, the parties to the, to the conflict, to the accident, to the incident, to the, uh, the subject being investigated are, 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 are not the best investigators. We, we, we should have an independent investigation. We would like to have it for our co-worker, Musa Shawa, who was killed uh, just under a month ago. We still don't have an explanation on, on that killing. This is an absolute minimum requirement, uh, certainly for World Central Kitchen, and, and but for all of us, uh, because we're wondering, are, are we next? Sean, have you had communications directly with Israeli officials about the safety of your team on the ground in Gaza? Sure, we communicate all the time. Uh, we we have to deconflict the the areas we work, the shelters where our staff and their families are staying, uh, where our staff are sheltering, our distribution centers, our cars. Uh, that all has to be deconflicted. We share the coordinates, the map coordinates of those, uh, and and we and we check in. We check in with them to verify, or they check in with us. Um, but we had a a check in from them four days before Musa Shawa was was killed in an airstrike and. And, and that and, and this World Central Kitchen uh, uh, killing now is, uh, uh, makes us worried, it makes us feel like it's, it's not working. When you say it's not working, to be clear, you're saying you are in constant contact. Groups on the ground are informing Israeli officials about your location and your coordinates. There's no way you see Israeli officials would not have known these were aid workers. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I mean, that certainly looks like the case with the World Central Kitchen, uh, the very clearly marked uh, cars in a three-car convoy. And this is something that's been an issue 
among many international NGOs uh, throughout the course of this war. And the deconfliction is actually done with the military, with the IDF. And so uh, the conversations and the communications feel like uh, they're genuine and we're all doing the right thing and, and we're deconflicting and we're getting things put into the system. But if people are killed when they shouldn't be, then obviously we we we, uh, we end up questioning whether this is, is working and it doesn't seem to be working. And what has been the response from Israeli officials when you raise those concerns? Well, we don't, we'd like a response on, on the death of our colleague. We don't have any response. Um, there seemed to be interest initially when they mistakenly thought he was an American citizen. Um, uh, that interest seemed to lessen when uh, we said he didn't have a U.S. passport. He's a Palestinian. Um, we don't have a response yet. I hope we'll get a response. That is Sean Carroll, president and CEO of ANERA, a nonprofit helping people in Gaza, spending operations for now. Mr. Carroll, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. For two views on Israel's strikes on the aid convoy, I spoke to Wes Bryant, a retired U.S. Air Force Joint Terminal Attack Controller who called in U.S. airstrikes and led U.S. strike planning cells, and retired Israeli Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Konrikas, who commanded IDF forces in Lebanon and Gaza and is now a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Jonathan Konrikas, let me start with you. As we just heard, uh, the chief of the general staff uh, called this incident a, quote, misidentification. Can you explain how that's possible when, as the World Central Kitchen says, it was coordinating with the IDF on its movements? What I understand from the IDF's after-action review, which has not yet been completed, what the IDF has said so far, we are responsible, we are accountable, and this is not Hamas's doing, we did it. That's number one. What they had that they have been established uh, able to establish that. What they have not yet been able to establish is how did this misidentification happen and how was an aid convoy mistaken for a, a vehicle <clears throat> carrying terrorists and who made the wrong decision, who misunderstood a very complex and dynamic battlefield and who got it wrong. I personally know that they are investigating it now, waiting for the outcomes for a transparent. <clears throat> an honest after-action review. Wes Bryant, what's your response to those two words? One, misidentification that we heard from the chief of the general staff, and as Jonathan <coughs> Karika said, some kind of misunderstanding or misunderstood a complex battlefield. Yes, um, and I appreciate those, those remarks. Uh, misidentification does, of course, happen in combat. But to me, this strike is, a, is just um, an effect or a demonstration of um, of, of, a, of a broader problem, and that's a pattern of targeting negligence, pattern of indifference towards civilian harm, and a pattern of disregard toward uh, international humanitarian law that the IDF has unfortunately, um, though being our allies, and though having a, a clear precedent to go after Hamas, which is a, a dangerous and, and, and brutal terrorist organization. Um, that the IDF has unfortunately demonstrated throughout their operation in Gaza. Jonathan Krikas, can you respond to that? Targeting negligence and a disregard for civilian casualties. Yeah, I think those are very unfortunate and incorrect comments or an assessment of IDF practices. I myself have been in the targeting rooms or the cells where we do those processes. I have seen the process, the, I've seen the legal overview, and I've seen the intelligence vetting that is done. Uh, which is part of protocol before we strike. We operate in an extremely complex environment, unlike expeditionary missions, which I think is the benchmark that you will bring up and give me examples of. But that benchmark is not really relevant because we are talking about defending our homeland here. We do not have the same leisure and time to be super extra uh, careful when it comes to taking out live military targets because our civilians are at risk here. Israel is committed to the, to the international law of armed warfare. Israel takes precaution. Israel uses distinction and proportionality, but that does not mean, sadly, that Palestinian civilians do not get uh, wounded or, or killed on the battlefield. But the responsibility for that is first and foremost with those who set up the battlefield, and that is Hamas, not Israel. Wes Bryant, take on those two points. One, there is a difference, as Jonathan Karikas 
put it, uh, between fighting, as you did in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, and fighting uh, in Israel itself or next to it in Gaza, uh, but also uh, international humanitarian law, specifically distinction and proportionality. Do you believe the IDF is following those two tenets? Uh, well, on the second point, I absolutely don't for the most part. Um, I think uh, an over 30,000 um, <clears throat> casualty ratio, whether or not, you know, nine or 10,000 of those are, are Hamas operatives, it's a huge ratio between uh, civilian casualties and, and combatants. Um, with, you know, comparing past wars with this, yes, every war has its differences, but, you know, urban combat is urban combat and, uh, and war is war. More importantly, international humanitarian law um, is, is just that. And what I see the IDF doing is taking the principles of uh, military necessity and proportionality and saying that basically any civilian loss that happens is justified because of the military necessity of this target. It's just not the way the U.S. Um, conducts warfare. Even with the civilian harm that the U.S. has caused, which it has, it has caused civilian harm, and we know that, um, the U.S. itself would absolutely not be conducting a targeting campaign in the way that IDF has in the last few months. And that's something that I think the whole world is paying attention to, and I think both Israeli and U.S. government need to pay closer attention to. Jonathan Karikas, you're shaking your head. Yes, I can personally tell of hundreds of strikes that have been aborted in real time in this war in Gaza because of the presence of children, civilians, women, elderly, and people who we assessed were not enemy combatants, and strikes, airstrikes, were called off because the proportionality between the military necessity and the importance of taking out a certain target did not warrant or justify the killing or the probable wounding of civilians. The Gaza battlefield is an area which is virtually impossible to fight in without having non-combatant casualties. That is how Hamas has rigged the battlefield. That is what we are fighting. And that is the sad reality that we, by trying to move civilians out of the battlefield, have tried to negate. That's what the Israeli Defense Forces did in the beginning. We called on civilians to evacuate because we know that fighting high-intensity warfare in urban terrain is a horrible endeavor that leads to casualties. Wes Bryant, Hamas has rigged the battlefield. How much does that matter, in your opinion, as you assess the IDF campaign? Well, Hamas's known use of human shields does not negate the other combatant, IDF in this case, the responsibility to protect uh, civilian and non-combatant lives. So the IDF has you know, put out statements up to Netanyahu, Netanyahu himself that um, these strikes have uh, unwitting or involuntary human shields that the Hamas is using, and therefore it's justified that we went after uh, this target and we can't avoid, in, in some of these cases, um, killing these civilians. Well, unfortunately, through that, IDF has also acknowledged that um, they are still striking when civilians or involuntary human shields are actually known in the target area. And that's, that's obvious even just from the reporting um, and the other uh, corroboration that we see. And so that's a, a problem under U.S. Uh, law of war. That would be a, a violation of our law of war and international humanitarian law. And other, under all that's common interpretations, it would be as well. I don't doubt that the IDF is calling off strikes, is aborting in some cases. They're just not doing it enough. I know there's, there's a lot more to discuss. Unfortunately, well, we're out of time. I, I want to thank you both. Wes Bryant, Jonathan Karikas, thanks very much for both your time. Thank, thank you. you. The strikes on the World Central Kitchen team came just hours after Israeli forces ended a two-week operation in the sprawling Al-Shifa complex, which used to be Gaza's largest hospital. Israel says it killed or detained hundreds of Hamas fighters. But as digital producer Dima Zain reports, the Al-Shifa complex is now in ruins. Gaza's Al-Shifa hospital and the area surrounding it is largely unrecognizable following a two-week Israeli military raid. 
The IDF confirmed its withdrawal from the now devastated complex Monday, saying 200 militants had been killed and 900 others detained during the raid. IDF spokesmen claimed they have evidence the facility was being used as a Hamas control base for northern Gaza, but Hamas denied the allegations and instead claimed Israel had killed 400 Palestinians during the siege, including civilians and medical personnel. The World Health Organization says at least 21 patients died since the raid began. Hazan resident Basil al Hello spoke about what he experienced during Israel's raid. <laughs> The situation was indescribable. Each person was found sitting in a corner by the wall. They were sitting as they were, but covered with blood. The bodies were left for over seven days. They were swollen. All the bodies suffered from factors of body decomposition. Thank God we were able to bury them, which was difficult due to the state of the bodies that were beginning to melt. The WHO says that over 100 patients still remain in the hospital awaiting care. Civilian buildings like hospitals are protected in conflict under international humanitarian law, but can lose that status if used for certain military operations against their adversaries. Most of the buildings of the Al-Shifa medical complex were completely destroyed and burned, and there is such huge destruction in the buildings and in the facilities of the Ministry of Health. It is not possible to work in Al-Shifa medical complex like this again. Al-Shifa medical complex is gone forever. At least 6,000 Palestinians have been sheltering in the Al-Shifa complex before Israel's operation began. It was one of the few locations remaining in North Gaza that had some access to electricity and water. On top of the disease, inadequate shelter, and what the UN calls looming famine, the children of Gaza have also lost access to consistent, safe schooling. My dreams have been voided. My ambition has been broken. My dreams have been lost. They're nothing. Myself, I used to want to do well and get grades and make my family happy and go to university and study and do well. But my ambitions have been voided. Everything has been broken. William Brangham has more. The education system in Gaza was facing serious challenges before the war began. But today, more than 800 lower schools and 17 higher education institutions lay in ruins, having been either partially bombed or entirely destroyed. Making matters worse, Gaza's population is disproportionately young and of school age. Around 65% are 24 years old or younger. David Skinner works for Save the Children, where he's the senior education cluster coordinator in the occupied Palestinian territory. He joins us from Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. David Skinner, thank you so much for joining us today. On some level, I think many of our viewers will be surprised to learn that there is any education that is able to go on in Gaza, given the ongoing war there. Can you just tell us a little bit about what kind of instruction and education children can get today? I don't think people should be thinking that it's a full-scale education. It's very hesitant, it's very trivial, but um, if you imagine that you're in a shelter in Ramallah, um, or sorry, in, 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 in Gaza, there is a very immediate desire for education to take place. And so what we're seeing in the shelters is organic education activities taking place. So parents are coming together, there are teachers in the shelters and uh, education is happening. It's not people sitting in rows with a whiteboard in front of them and teachers um, uh, teaching the times table or, 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 or the alphabet. It's a place for, for structure and for some kind of escape, if you like, from the immediacy of the issues in front of you. I mean, just as you're describing it, I imagine that it, on some level it does provide some small trace of normalcy of what life used to be like before the bomb started to fall. Those people who are expert in, uh, in mental health are, t are telling us educationists that one of the most important things for the mental health of children is to give them a rhythm, is to give them security, is to give them some kind of predictability. Um, and school plays an enormous part in that. And I don't want to exaggerate this, uh, William. I don't want you to, to feel that there's a sort of a, a fully fledged or anything like a fully fledged system in, in Gaza. I think it's more accurate to, to think of the um, shoots of education coming up within the shelters as, um, as communities are trying to care for their children. Can you just share some sense of what you are hearing from your colleagues about how those children in shelters are doing? I have children, I think you've got children, William. Imagine your children in a shelter where 
you as a, as a parent are concerned, they as a child are concerned that a missile is going to hit the shelter, that they're going to be harmed if they go into the street, they don't have enough food to eat. Many of them are sick as well. There's diarrhea, there's chest infections and so on going on. Many are facing food poverty and in the north, they're facing malnutrition. And no child has been to school in any formal sense since the 7th of October. That's nearly an academic year of, of schooling that's been, that's been lost. So if you had academic uh, dreams, hopes, aspirations, those have, been, those have taken a hit. It's not good being a child in Gaza at the moment. You were talking about the schools, and, and the Israelis argue that they only target structures where Hamas was operating. Have you or any of your staff seen any evidence that that is the case? I have not seen evidence that um, Hamas have been in the schools, but it's not my um, area of authority. I mean, what I can say is that over 70% of schools have been either destroyed or damaged. So one of the big challenges we're going to be facing after there is a definitive ceasefire is the physical reconstruction of schools, which is going to be expensive, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be more difficult than, say, after an earthquake because you've got unexploded ordnance scattered through the rubble. But it's comparatively simple, conceptually at least, compared to um, some of the other issues that we're going to be facing. The biggest issue that children are going to be facing um, in terms of catching up is, the, is, is their mental health. Frankly, um, it's going to be really tough to try to support children who've been so, so much going through that. So you've got a physical, you've got an educational, and you've got a mental health set of issues once there's a definitive ceasefire. All right, David Skinner of Save the Children, thank you so much for spending time with us. That's fine, thank you. From all of us here at PBS News Weekly, thanks so much for watching.